I'm going to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to pick up the reading with verse 7. Hebrews 12 verse 7. Normally I would ask you to stand uh, as a way to honor the reading of God's Word, but because I want to kind of uh, just break down a few of these verses as we go, I'm going to just ask you to stay seated. Verse 7, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Now let's stop for just a second and be clear about what we mean by the word discipline. Sometimes when you think about discipline, you think about a dad saying to his child, you're in trouble, go to your room. You're in trouble, go to time out or whatever, you're grounded. But when the writer of the Hebrews is talking here about discipline, he's not saying that God is looking at his people and saying you're grounded. This discipline is not punishment. This is the kind of discipline that's for a child's good, to try to help them to be everything that that parent wants them to be. In other words, this isn't go to your room. This is you're not going to eat Doritos after midnight. This is the kind of discipline that says you're going to do your homework, not because I don't love you, but because I do. This is the kind of discipline that says you're going to have some chores around the house because I want you to develop a good work habit and become a responsible citizen. This is the kind of discipline we're talking about. This is not discipline as punishment. This is discipline to help the child become all that the parent wants them to be. Now look at verse 8. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. You are not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits, that's our heavenly Father, and live? They, our earthly parents, disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good And here's the part I want you to see. In order that we may share in his holiness. Why does God discipline us? That we might share in his holiness. Now verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. Can I get an amen? Amen. It's painful. Later on, however, it does something. It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone who agrees with you. (laughs) Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy because without holiness that lives in peace with each other no one will see the Lord see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many and see that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau so what does sexual immorality have to do with holiness and what does Esau have to do with sexual immorality we're going to find out Esau, for a single meal, he sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. I'm going to call him George. That's not his real name. George was a member of one of the churches that I pastored, and I've decided not to use real names anymore because the Church of the Nazarene has about 100 families around the world. (laughs) So George, a real person, not his real name, he was a member of one of my churches, and he was a very unhappy person. He was always upset about something. He didn't like the music. He didn't like my preaching. He said, you don't preach holiness like I heard holiness preached when I was a kid. 
And he didn't particularly even like people, <laughs> especially new people. And George would write me long seven-page letters of some of the most mean and ugly comments that you can imagine, not only attacking every move I made as a pastor, but assuming to know my motives. Not only I don't agree with what you did, but I think I know why you did what you did. I said, George, how do you know that? I don't even know why I do what I do sometimes. <laughs> and for a while, his complaints were that, oh, pastor, the church is ingrown. We're not reaching new people. And when the church began to grow, he didn't like that either because now he's saying, Pastor, all you do is think about the new folks. You don't care anymore about the people who, who built this church and gave their money. And then he said, you're only stealing sheep from other churches. That's how our churches are growing. But the bottom line was he didn't like things to change. And he took up so much of my emotional energy as a pastor he kept threatening to leave, but regrettably, he never did. <laughs> he never left. And I think deep down, George knew what all of us knew. There's no other church that would put up with him. <laughs> and finally, one day, I called George on the phone. I said, George, listen, I love you. You know I love you, but no more letters. I'm never going to open another letter you send me. I'm never going to read another email you send me. If you want to talk to me, we're going to get together. We're going to have coffee. We're going to be face to face. You tell me what's on your heart. I'll tell you what's on my heart. You can't feel my love through a letter. I certainly don't feel your love through a letter. <laughs> I'll never read another letter. And for a while, it seemed as if things got a little better. He never sent me another letter. But he just kept spreading negativity constantly. And it got to the point that George was kind of more like a mosquito than an attack dog. He was more annoying than dangerous. But the saddest part of me for those years that I pastored George was that George was not being transformed. He was a cranky guy. And he'd been cranky pretty much his whole life. And it wasn't just the church. He wasn't a good husband to his wife. He wasn't a good father to his children. His children couldn't relate to him. That's why they left the church. And he'd been going to church his entire life for 65 years. And maybe worst of all, nobody was surprised that George wasn't changing. Nobody was surprised that he stayed cranky year after year after year. And no one even seemed that bothered by it. It was as if they just expected it. They would say, oh, pastor, that's just George. That's the way George has always been. You'll, you'll get used to it. But nobody was really expecting George to become more and more like Jesus. And in thinking about George, it dawned on me that the wrong question to ask about the health of a church is how many people are attending here? Now, that's not a bad question. It's just not the primary question. But the right question, or at least moving in the right direction, is to ask the question, what are these people like? Amen. What kind of people are they? Because you know that when someone becomes a Christian, the goal for you is not just to learn how to follow Christ, but that your life would actually begin to reflect Christ-likeness, that you begin to think like Jesus and speak like Jesus and act like Jesus, and we call that holiness. Now, you know that the, one of the core values of the Church of the Nazarene is we are holiness, and it's been interesting to me as a, as a kind of a deeply rooted Nazarene for all of my life, my entire life. I was born a Nazarene, and I have chosen to be a Nazarene. And it's this, that while we've definitely been about the concept of holiness, we've kind of had a hard time agreeing about what we meant by that. And we've even had some pretty good, like, sanctified fights about holiness, which is kind of an odd thing. <laughs> Sometimes we, we love the concept of holiness more than we love the people who disagree with us about holiness. But depending on where you were raised, who your pastors were, who your Sunday school teachers were, who your college professors were, 
we've had different ways of expressing it. But here's, it, but here's what you got to know about the Church of the Nazarene. Of all the things those early founders believed in, and they, and they did have a lot of disagreements. You do know that. 115 or 20 years ago, when the Church of the Nazarene was founded, when those, those various denominations came together and they merged, there, were, there was at least a dozen things they did not agree on. But the one thing they passionately agreed on, and they were completely unified in, is that God is really serious about us becoming a holy people. But here's where we live right now. We live in what I want to call the tensions of holiness. And I, I didn't say the problems of holiness. I didn't say the conflicts of holiness. But I'm talking about the fact that there's such a thing as a, as a dialectical tension. And here's what a dialectical tension is. is when what appears to be two opposite forces that are coexisting at the same time. And this truth is completely true, and this truth is completely true, and although they seem to be in opposition to each other, they're both 100% true as long as they're kept in balance. But the moment that one of those truths begins to overtake the other truth, suddenly it gets out of balance, and both of them become somewhat untrue. That's what we call a dialectical tension. Two coexisting, what appear to be simultaneously differing ideas held in balance, but only in tension and in balance are they both true. Now, let me show you what I mean by that. When it comes to holiness, there's, there's two things I want to highlight for you of what we believe in the Church of the Nazarene is our identity as a holiness people. First of all, we believe that holiness is both instantaneous and progressive. Say that with me, would you? Holiness is instantaneous and progressive. You say those don't mean the same thing. You're right. But it's a necessary, let's keep that up for just a second if you don't mind. It's a necessary both and. Holiness is, is instantaneous and it's progressive. So let me explain to you what I mean. Holiness is instantaneous in an important sense. And it doesn't matter if you were raised in the church as a child or if you became a Christian as an adult. I honestly have never known a person who is following Jesus in my entire life who doesn't come to a point in their walk with the Lord where they say, I'm in a relationship with Jesus, I've, I'm walking with Jesus, but I haven't given my whole self yet to Jesus. And it has nothing to do with condemnation. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're going to go to heaven. It has nothing to do with whether you've been walking in all the light as he is in the light. Because when you become a Christian, what it really literally means is that you are walking in all the light he's giving you. But when you become a believer, when, when there's a conversion in your life, you, you give him everything you have. You don't know what more you can possibly give him. You give him your whole self, but, but as you be, continue to walk with the Lord, you realize there's areas of my life I didn't even know I needed to give to him. And so there's areas that he keeps shining his light on and searchlight and saying, David, what's that room over there? What's that locked room in your heart? What's that shadowy part of the room over there, David, in your heart? And I have to continually be re-surrendering that to him. So in essence, this is what it means. I haven't emptied myself of self. I haven't yet invited Jesus to be in full control of my life. He has become my Savior, but now I have to come to a point where I say, I want you to be Lord. I want you to be master of everything. And so in a moment of full consecration, you bow your knee and say, Lord, I've been forgiven of my sin but now I want to surrender my whole self to you. I want your way and your will. That's what we call the deeper work of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like when you went to camp, when you were at the, in summertime. You remember how you used to go down on Thursday night to the altar because you knew you had to go home on Friday morning? <laughs> and, and you remember how you just went down and you say, Lord, I just give you my whole 16-year-old self. Everything I am, I belong to you. You're, I want you to have complete control of my 16-year-old life. And when we prayed that prayer on a Thursday night, I believe that we were fully sanctified in that moment. I believe the Holy Spirit came 
and consecrated and purified my 16-year-old heart. And something had to happen in an instant. Something had to happen instantaneously. I was sanctified. And John Wesley said it something like this. If there's a moment where you do not love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, there also has to become a moment when you do, when you transfer over into the full surrender moment. So in that moment, my 16-year-old self was fully consecrated. God had purified my heart, and I was fully surrendered to him. But here's what had to happen. I had to go home. And I had to go back home to the very same parents that I was fighting with when I left. I had to go back to the same school, back to the same friends, back to the same kind of potential habits that were there before. And all of that had to happen. And there was a growth in grace that had to take place in my life to take what I experienced in that moment, in that moment of full consecration, when the perfect love of God had filled up my heart. I was as sanctified as I could possibly be, but now, instantaneously, I now had to grow into the grace that God had filled me with. Now, here's another way for you to think about it. Christy and I were married... 39 years ago. It was January 8th, 1983, and, and we could not have been more married than we were in that moment. I was 18 years old. She was 18 years old. You say, that's really young. Yes, it is. I don't recommend it. <laughs> we lived in Oklahoma. We didn't even have cable television. It seemed like the right thing to do. <laughs> so it really happened. And I was walking out of that church with Christy, 18 years old, and, you know, we used to throw rice at people. Do you remember that? That was not PC. I know all of that. But as I was holding her hand and being hit in the face with rice, and we were walking to get into that car with all the cans that were strung on the back, this is what I felt. Wow. I'm 18. She's 18. We're married, man. I'm as married as I can possibly be. I'm really married. We could, this could be a long, long uh, relationship. <laughs> I am so married right now. But I want to tell you something. 39 years later, I am so much more married <laughs> than I was when I was 18 years old. I am way more married. We've been through a lot together. We've had, we've had three kids. We have six grandchildren. We have one on the way. We've had some amazing highs. We've had some devastating lows. We've had a whole lot of in-between. We are so much more married than we were 39 years ago. But here's the thing. I was as married as I could possibly be when I was 18 years old. It's exactly the same way that the Lord works in our life and the life of holiness. You could not be more consecrated than you are in that moment where he instantaneously purifies your heart and begins to make you like Jesus. But that's just the beginning of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit, as N.T. Wright says, is just, they're just blossoms. They're just possibilities. And love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and goodness and self-control. You don't get up from that altar and say, my life is in full self-control. You don't get up from that altar and say, I have all the love and joy and peace that I'll ever have in my life. No, now you have the potential. Because now in an instantaneous moment, he has done that work in your heart. But now you have to begin to grow in the grace that God has given you. So holiness is instantaneous and it's progressive. Are you with me? Now, I pastored my very first church in a place called Livermore, California. It's an East Bay city just outside of San Francisco. People say, well, that's, that's a very liberal part of the country. It is, unless you know Livermore. Livermore is a cowboy town. In fact, it's full of professional PGA rodeo people. And Ron, when Ron came to our church, he was a, he was a professional bull rider. He was six foot two. He was about, about 220 pounds and pure muscle, not an ounce of fat on his body. And, I mean, he was big. He was strong. He was a tough bull rider. He used to wear those Wrangler jeans that are so tight they look like they got painted on. 
and he used to, you know, he'd wear them to church. They would be like pressed, and he'd have these big cowboy boots. This was Ron. But Ron's life was so messed up. It was so full of addictions. It was so full of brokenness. His marriage was falling apart. His little kids, he, he wasn't a good dad. There was a whole lot going wrong. But there in our church, Ron met Jesus, and his life began to change. Now, he had a lot of stuff he had to overcome, but his life was changed. And I remember the day he came to me, and he was so humble, but he's, he could hardly look me in the eyes. He said, Pastor, is there anything I can do to just help the church? I mean, I know I can't be a Sunday school teacher. I know, I, I know that I got a lot of stuff that God's working on me with, but I just really want to serve the church. And i trying to think of what I could give him to do, and all I could think of was I said, Ron, you know, between these two services, we need somebody to pick up the sanctuary and, and to be sure it's, you know, it looks good for the second service. And I thought, is he going to be offended that I've asked him to basically be like the garbage collector? And Ron starts crying. Tears well up in his eyes, and he said, oh, pastor, he said, I would be honored to do that. I never, I never felt like there'd be anything I could do to serve the church, but he said, I will take that seriously. That's how God was working in his life. And Ron would come, and he would sit right on the very first row, and he would worship Jesus with passion and tears with his hands in the air, but he also came to church every Sunday with a big round thing sticking out of his back pocket. And, and he also came with this, his lip was sticking out like this. And he would come to church with a, with a plastic cup. And he'd be worshiping Jesus right there in the front row. Oh, Jesus, thank you. I love you, Lord. And he'd spit into his cup. <laughs> Happened every single Sunday. Praise the Lord into the cup. And I was terrified. I was honestly terrified that somebody in the church was going to go up and tell Ron, we're really glad you're here, but you can't dip skull and come to church here. But it happened week after week after week, and finally one Sunday Ron came to church, and he didn't have anything in his lip. And I didn't see a cup. I thought, well, maybe he's swallowing now. I didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> but he didn't have anything in his pocket either. I went, oh, no, she got to him. I don't even know who she was, but I just knew she'd gotten to him. <laughs> so as soon as service was over, I, I, I immediately I went to Ron and said, hey, Ron, let me talk to you. And I said, hey, I, I don't see any skull today. And he said, no, there's not. And I said, did somebody talk to you? He goes, no. And I said, well, where's the skull? He said, well, you know how you've been trying to teach me how to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and I know that Jesus is speaking to me. He said, I was reading my Bible the other day, and I was praying, and I just felt like Jesus said to me, Ron, do you still need that tobacco in your life? He said, no, Jesus, you're everything to me. You've, you've changed my life. And Jesus said, well, why don't you just stop? I said, so what'd you do? He said, well, I just quit. I said, how long have you been dipping? He said, probably since I was 12 or 13 years old. Aren't you glad that we don't have to be the morals police at our church? Aren't you glad that we can trust the Holy Spirit to work in every single person's life in just their time? You know what had happened to Ron? He had been sanctified in a moment. In a moment of time, his heart was cleansed. But his holiness had to grow through his lifetime. And I hope that you're as holy as you can possibly be right now. But I also hope that next year when I come to district assembly, God willing, that you're more like Jesus then than you are today. Because holiness is instantaneous and holiness is also progressive. So we got to keep it in balance. But here's the second point. I just have two points. Holiness is also spiritual and practical. It's both. Now, when I say it's spiritual, I'm not going to take a long time on this except simply to say this, holiness takes the spirit. In order for you to be like Jesus, there's no amount of your work that's going to make you like Jesus. If the spirit's not equipping you to do it, empowering you to do it, it's going to be pure frustration. I mean, you can't grit your teeth and say, I'm going to be more have more love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. I'm going to be a more happy person. That's just not going to work in your own strength. 
You can't moralistically become like Jesus. To be like Jesus requires Jesus. To be like, to have, be a spirit-filled person requires having the spirit. And so in that sense, I, I don't want you to walk away with any sense that this is about you trying to work harder apart from the Spirit. The Spirit's work in you is not just to purify you, but it is to empower you to be able to do what He has called you to do. And because you couldn't save yourself in the same way, you cannot sanctify yourself. You, that, that's, the, that's the root problem of Pharisaism is it's, it's not that your motive is wrong. You want to be a holy person, but it's that you're trying to be holy in the wrong way. And, and if, if you're just trying to do it yourself, apart from the power of the Spirit, then what you're going to become is kind of mean and kind of legalistic and, and kind of angry and harsh. And the, and the world doesn't need more holiness people who are harsh and mean. Part of the thing that drives people away from the church is because there's holiness people, proclaimed holiness people, who, who look not just like other, other people, they look meaner than other people. <laughs> and that's not attractive. And so the first thing I want to say to you about the holy life is it takes the spirit. you got to hold that intention. But you also have to keep it in balance with the second part. And that is holiness is practical. And when I say that, I mean, with the power of the Holy Spirit, you have to now begin to engage in holy practices. I, I love what that Russian comedian, Yakov Smirnov, you remember him? He said, when I first came to the United States, that's a terrible Russian accent. <laughs> when I first came to the United States, I wasn't prepared for the incredible variety of instant products that I found in American grocery stores. He says, on my first shopping trip, I saw powdered milk. You just, you just add water and you get milk. Amazing. And he said, then I saw powdered orange juice. You just add water and you get orange juice. And then he said, I saw baby powder. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what a country. That's the way our culture is. We're in an instant everything culture. We want everything and we want it right now. I mean, we, we want two-minute popcorn. We want, we want, have you ever seen somebody yelling at their laptop in Panera Bread because the Wi-Fi wasn't as fast as they wanted it to be? I'm sorry. I apologize that I did that. <laughs> but we want what we want. We want it fast. Christy just bought a, something called an Instapot. Apparently... There's a way to get your rice in one minute instead of two minutes now, through the Instapot. <laughs> we live in an instant gratification society. You just add water, and poof, this is what you get. And the same thing, unfortunately, has applied to the way we think about the spiritual life. We, we think we can go down to the altar and pray a prayer of full consecration. I surrender all, and we can get up, and we never have to invest in our pursuit of holiness again. But that's created a lot of frustration. That's created, that's created a lot of people saying, is this really real? It is real. But you have to take what happened to you in an instantaneous moment by the power of the Spirit, and now you have to begin to walk and practice holiness practices. Holiness is not magic. The life of Jesus in you is, is not just, it's not all him and nothing on you. And it might be 99% Jesus, but Jesus won't do anything finally apart from your participation. The whole, the whole free will concept is simply to say that Jesus wants to be in a right relationship with you. He, he, wants, he wants to be in a love relationship. So, now back to the text, this Esau thing. What does that have to do with this whole idea of holiness? What was Esau's sin? You remember the story of Jacob and Esau. They're twins. And their mother, even when they were in her womb, these two babies were wrestling around. They were fighting with each other. 
And, and it so bothered her that she went to the Lord to inquire of the Lord and say, why are my babies fighting within me? And, and the Lord said, there are two nations in your womb, and they're going to be fighting with each other for the rest of their lives. In fact, it's been going on now for thousands of years. And even the moment when they're being born, we know that Esau was born first, and Jacob was holding on to his heel and saying, no, me first. I mean, he's grasping even as he's being born. And these two boys are born. They're born minutes apart, but they could not have been more different. Esau, and he was a man's man. You know what Esau literally means? It means big, red, hairy guy. I mean, you just named, you, you looked at your kid, yep, he's a big, red, hairy guy, Esau. And he was an outdoor guy. He, he drove an F-150 with a, with a gun rack. He, he drank Red Bull. You know, he, he, uh, he liked to kill stuff. He was the linebacker on his football team. He was a man's man, and his dad loved him for it. And his dad just doted on him and pretty much just ignored Jacob. Jacob, on the other hand, was, well, he, he wasn't like that. You know, Jacob wore skinny jeans. <laughs> he drove a Volvo. He drank lattes. <laughs> he, he, uh, he watched the cooking channel. He was, that's just kind of who he was. And his mother loved him for it. And she doted on him. And his father and pretty, she pretty much thought that Esau was an idiot. And the way their parents treated Jacob and Esau, it ravaged their character. Both of these boys lived up to their name, big red hairy guy, and Jacob, the grasper, the deceiver. One day, Esau comes home from a hunting trip. He's, he hasn't killed anything. He's hungry. He's starving. You know, he's driven by his appetites. And he walks into the camp, and he smells something, and he realizes somebody's cooking dinner. And there is Jacob. Jacob is stewing. He, he is making a stew, and Esau said, what's for dinner? Jacob says, well, I'm cooking up some red stew. And he said, give me some of that stew. And all of a sudden, Jacob realizes. I don't know how he knew, but in that moment, he knew, I've got him. My brother is an idiot. And so here's what Jacob does. He says, what do you give me for a bowl of this red stew? What do you want? Oh, I don't know. I was thinking, like, maybe your birthright? <laughs> and some of you are laughing, and, and you know why. Because that was a ridiculous thing to ask for. The birthright, that's the most important and valuable possession that a, that a family could possess. If you were the firstborn son in a family, it didn't matter if there were 15 sons born after you, you became the leader of that family. You were the clan leader. You, you had all of the possessions. You had all of the inheritance rights. All the power was in your hands. Everybody wanted to be the firstborn. But here's what he said. He said, give me your birthright. And Esau says, sounds like a good deal to me. I'm hungry. And in that moment, he became the father of instant gratification. Trading something of infinite value and inestimable worth for a moment to feed his appetite. He said, David, do people still do that today? People do it all the time. They do it in a spiritual sense. They do, it, they do it in their relationships. Anytime somebody's willing to trade 15 minutes in a hotel room for their marriage, that's called the Esau syndrome. That's trading some of your most infinitely important relationship for a moment of, of meeting an appetite. And somebody looks at a computer screen at microdots, and, and gives up all their other relationships and intimacy, that's called the Esau syndrome. Now, people do it all the time. And the writer of the Hebrews is trying to tell us this is how people deal with their holiness. They actually work in the very same way. They, they make this full consecration to God. They say, I want all of you, Jesus. I, I, want, I want to be a holy person, but I don't want to have to do any of the tough stuff to get there. 
I don't want the discipline part. I just want the peace and the joy part. But I'm not willing to do anything to invest in my own holiness. That's what this whole passage is about. People who want what they want, they want it now, even in a spiritual sense. I want to be like Jesus without all the hard work that goes into it. I just want the magic to happen. The writer of the Hebrews is trying to say, when you do that, you are forfeiting the most important things in your life, including the potential to look like Jesus. It happens all the time. What are some of the ways that we engage in discipline? Not as punishment. We're not talking about go to your room. We're talking about becoming like Christ, of sharing in his holiness. Well, the, the early mothers and fathers of the church, they used to talk about spiritual disciplines this way. They called them the means of grace. The way that God pours his grace into your life, they believed happened through the spiritual disciplines, the practices of the holy life. What are they? Prayer. If you want to be more and more like Jesus, if you want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all those things to grow into full blossom, you have to be more than a Christian who prays. You have to become a praying Christian. And there's a difference. You have to learn to meditate in the Word of God. God's Word is authoritative. It is a standard that helps us not to be pulled back and forth by culture so that culture is not informing who we are, but God's Word is the standard. You have to immerse yourself in that. You can't just read Oswald Chambers for five minutes in the morning and call that immersion. I hope you read Oswald Chambers. I do too. But I've got to immerse myself in the Word of God so that, so that even the blind spots in my life begin to be revealed and, and shown a light on by the Holy Spirit. We have to learn to fast, to, to set aside some things in order to be filled up with other things. We have to be worshipers. We have to be people who serve. We have to be people who find solitude. How many of you know it wouldn't be the worst thing in our lives if we gave up Facebook for one week? These are the ways, these are the practices by which the Spirit that, and it requires the Spirit, but these are the ways that we become more and more like Jesus. This is how the fruit of the Spirit begins to to have blossom in your life. Now, let me give you one more quick story. I, when I was a younger guy, I started playing golf. I loved to play golf, and in that, that was when Tiger Woods was just coming into his own. And, and so, there was Tiger, and I, I thought, you know what? Tiger wears a hat with a swoosh on it, so I need to get a hat with a swoosh on it so I can play like Tiger. And Tiger would wear red shirts on, on the last day of a tournament, and, and I thought, i got to get a red golf shirt like Tiger has. Tiger would do stuff with his, you know, when he'd get down and he'd read the putting green like this. He'd take his hands, and I had no idea what he was doing, but I started doing that. <laughs> I literally would do that every time I put. I had no idea what I was doing. I figured Tiger did it. You need to do it. I wanted to play golf like Tiger. But you know what I didn't know? I didn't know that Tiger had been playing golf since he was like two years old. You know what I didn't see? I didn't see the literal hours and hours that Tiger would be on the practice range until, his, until he had blisters on his hands. I didn't know that he'd play 18 holes, and then he'd go practice for two hours after the 18 holes. I wanted to play like Tiger, but I didn't want to invest my work into playing like Tiger. That's also what happens in the church. We look over and we say, oh, you know, sister so-and-so, she is such a spirit-filled person. Look at how much It's like Jesus is all over her. She has so much peace. She has so much wisdom. It's like nothing can faze her. And we want to be like sister so-and-so, but what we haven't seen is the hours and hours and hours and years and years that she spent connected to the vine. We've not seen her in her room when no one else was watching, where character was being formed in her. We hadn't seen the hours that she'd spent on her knees in the presence of Jesus. We want what she has, but we're not willing to invest in the discipline of God, not the punishment, but the practices required for us to be like that spirit-filled person. There's a person called Count Zinzendorf, 
and he was a founder of a, of a Moravian community at Hernhut. He was a great influence on John Wesley. And he said it so well. This is, this is something he said back in the, in the 18th century. He said, many people will follow the Lord halfway, but not the other half. He said, they will willingly give up possessions and property and wealth, but it touches them too deeply to disown themselves. My brother and sister, holiness discipleship, it's wonderful to be saved from our sins. It's amazing. I hope you never get over the moment of your salvation. But I want you to know something. God has something even more for you. It's not that that wasn't enough. That's amazing. But he not only wants to save you, he wants to make you recreated in the image of his own son, Jesus. And he's willing to discipline you out of love to get you there. Holiness is instantaneous and it's progressive. Holiness is spiritual and it's practical. Lord, I pray this morning that you will speak to your people. Lord, dismantle the myths and all of the, uh, the mystery that keeps us clouded from understanding your purposes for us. Lord, help us to deeply desire in our own lives what you desired for us from the foundations of the world, which was that your children would look like Jesus. And so, Lord, we as a people, we are surrendering ourselves back to you again. Lord, we, we want to be saved from our sins. We want our past to be reclaimed, but we also we, we want to become more and more like what you intend us to be. So fill us, Lord. Maybe there's someone here today who has never bowed their knee to you in a full consecrated moment and said, Lord, I surrender all. I give you my everything. Would you do that, Lord, in their hearts right now and help them to begin the moment that they can now be empowered by your spirit to be all that you want them to be? And for those of us, Lord, who have been walking in the light for a long, long time, I just pray that you would renew our passion, that you, would, that, that, that you wouldn't just make us more committed, but that you would somehow, Lord, give us uh, the discipline in our lives to begin to lean into the pursuit of the holy life that you called us to. Forgive us, Lord, when we look like Esau. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.